Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Sandy, and I'm an alcoholic. And Chris is uh, the best friend a person could have. I just can't tell you how he has helped me through situations. He does all the work for our retreat and um, all my surgeries. He was in the hospital. I'd wake up. There he was. (laughs) And uh, my daughter's memorial service, he took time off from work to go to Connecticut with me. And, uh, I mean, it's just wonderful and both he and his wife I want to thank she would be in the hospital too I'd look up and there they were and my god so I'm very very grateful for that and I just want everybody to know uh, they asked me to talk about uh, AA's first three steps which I'm happy to do and I was thinking about um, how to you know you have a certain way you've been talking about them for year after year, and you really get bored of yourself. And so I've made a few transitions over the years. Uh, so I'm just trying to entertain myself tonight. <laughs> so if it doesn't make any sense, it was fun for me, and you'll just have to put up with it. But I got to thinking about... Um, if Bill had had his, followed his original plan, our first step would have read, having had a spiritual awakening, we eagerly ran from drunk to drunk trying to sell him on the idea of spiritual awakenings. <laughs> and because of Dr. Silkworth, he talked him out of that plan, which was not working. Drunks were not interested in hearing about great big hot flashes and the room lighting up and all of that. And so the doctor said, Bill, I think you should start out by with the hopelessness of the disease and that you should hammer that in until they absolutely realize how desperate their situation is. And then they might become interested in the spiritual stuff. And I think he's right. I mean, it's just if you're doing good, it's hard to have to give up control of your life to someone else as you're asked to do here in AA. It's almost impossible. Our egos won't allow that. And so thanks to Dr. Silkworth, Bill shifted it around. And, uh, boy, you got, I don't know how many pages before we get to step two in the big book, 50 probably, counting the doctor's opinion. So there's a lot of effort put in to making sure that the new person understands the exact nature of the disease of alcoholism. And what it generally involves doing is convincing them that it's a lot worse than they think it is. They come in and go, oh, my God, my life's a mess. You don't know half of it. Sit down. (laughs) We're going to explain to you how it really is. And if you do a good job as a sponsor, they're sitting there shaking when when you finish. So there's no happiness in step one. There's no, oh, boy, I'm so glad I took that and I feel wonderful. You have the necessary ingredient for Alcoholics Anonymous, which is desperation. You suddenly went from, God, it's bad, to desperation. And that makes the rest of the program a lot easier. And we can have these things happen to us that are so crucial for the um, happy sobriety for the rest of our lives. And that is a spiritual awakening. And it's interesting that uh, Bill was influenced by the varieties of religious experience, William James, where his study of these spiritual awakenings, the common factor in every one of them was desperation. People encountered situations 
in their lives, not alcoholics, so some of them probably were, but just people. And uh, they just got down where they just were hopeless and they cried out to God. And they had a personal experience. And we understand that when that happens, we no longer have knowledge, if we had any, about God. We have a personal experience. And a personal experience is much different than knowing. In other words, knowing God is a lot different than knowing about God. I mean, it's just like night and day. And that's what the desperation in step one enables us to have one of these experiences. I think it's the, it's just crucial. So when I sponsor people, I tell them while we're starting, I said, I'm going to guide you to a spiritual awakening. It's not maybe. It is going to happen to you. And you're really going to be excited when that happens. <laughs> and then you can tell them, like Bill was telling how exciting it is and what it's like and how everything looks different and how you see yourself differently and how comfortable you are. And the world makes sense. And the world is so attractive that there's no reason to drink. What could drinking fix? That's a pretty big promise, isn't it? We're going to take you to the promised land. What is Bill's fourth dimension of existence? All these terms that when you read the book, you go, oh, that's a figure of speech. That doesn't exist. There's no such thing as that land. There's no such thing as that dimension of existence or whatever he's talking about. And the answer is, yes, there is. And we have a map in these 12 steps that guides you right to the treasure. And I've always said that um, the big book is not the treasure. It's the map. God is the treasure. So don't be worshiping the book. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not. It doesn't have the power to do anything. It's a guide to get you to the power that can transform your life. And so it all begins with this call for desperation. And in looking for a starting point, I, I just looked around, looked around, and I suddenly said, I think one of the best starting points you could have is the first sentence in the 12 and 12. Who cares to admit complete defeat? Whoa. Who cares to admit? Not defeat. Complete defeat. Unconditional. You're going to give up. And when I think about unconditional surrender, I think about the World War II with the Japanese. And uh, they knew they were beat. And the military was pretty much in charge over there, even though it made it look like the emperor was. The military was really holding the reins. And they clearly wanted a conditional surrender so that Japan would still have a military, and they could all still be kind of big shots. And it took the second bomb to get them to change their mind and go for unconditional surrender. No conditions. You don't get to say, you have no say-so about anything. How do you like that? How would you like to start with that coming into AA? You are now going to have nothing to say about anything. That would be a big... <laughs> And you wouldn't be able to extract that kind of a agreement unless the person was desperate. And so MacArthur went in and changed everything. Every old idea that the Japanese country had, they threw away and came in with new ones. And then he gave it back to them. And boy, look what that country did. It just took off and became quite a place. Quite a place. And the same thing happened in Europe. They got rid of a lot of, dicta not dictatorships, but kings, monarchies, and changed the format so that wars couldn't break out so easily um, between countries. Um, so there was a lot done with unconditional surrender. And so here we are coming in, and this thing says, who cares to admit complete defeat? And we have to talk about that. We have to realize what that might entail. And I wrote down a couple of uh, sentences because I came up with the word abandon. 
You know, when the when the um, captain of a ship when it gets to the end, they go abandon ship. You you must be down to the bottom when you are going to abandon ship. You know, you're just okay. We're leaving, <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to sink. What is our ship that we're going to abandon? Our old way of life. That's our ship. It's the one we put together. It's our plan for living. This is the one I thought up, and I sail around, and I'm the captain of this damn thing. (laughs) Now, it's a terrible voyage. I hate it. It sucks. (laughs) But I'm the captain. That's worth something right there. My life may be awful, but I'm in charge of it at least. So (laughs) It's hard to get people to give up until it gets really desperate. You know, some people... Five times in jail, didn't make it that. The sixth time, you know, I think I'm going to go check that AA out. There was something. And so these are the um, abandoned quotes that I found. In Bill's story, he said, My wife and I abandon ourselves with enthusiasm to the idea of helping alcoholics to a solution of their problem. That's remarkable. I mean, they don't have any money. She's working in a department store, and he's just out of treatment. Let's abandon ourselves to helping other alcoholics. Ah, that's a rare occurrence that a couple would do that. And they did. And they did. How about that? They did. And they never stopped. Only partway along the way, Lois went helping the families of alcoholics. So they were including everybody in this marvelous decision of abandonment. Let's forget about ourselves. Let's commit to this. Then another one is, many of us have been so touchy that even casual reference to spiritual things made us bristle with antagonism. I know that feeling. I don't want to hear about God. I don't want to hear any of that stuff. This sort of thinking had to be abandoned. You see what I'm saying? It's like you can't even keep a remnant of that. Out. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. It's a, isn't that a beautiful word to express defeat? Just I'm abandoning. Right after the third step prayer, we thought well before taking this step, making sure we were ready, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly. Now we're carrying it to the superlative. We're going to abandon ourselves utterly to God. And then, of course, on page 164, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. So I I picked that, who cares to admit defeat, to show where defeat can take us. It's the only path to success and to happiness in the spiritual world is complete defeat. And so, as much as we resist it in the beginning, we have to come to grips with it if you want to have happy sobriety. I only talk about happy sobriety. I don't talk about bare knuckle, holding on, just not drinking day to day. That's fine. But eventually, you're going to wear out. That's going to be too trying and too exhausting. And so you're going to want to have what these other happy people have. And they're going to all tell you, well, then you're going to have to give up more, more, more. So if you look at the first step when Bill uses that, who cares to admit complete defeat, he's talking about alcohol. But as we go through the steps, and you'll hear our presenters, especially when they get to six and seven, that we're going to have to admit complete defeat in all other areas of our lives. That's the only way to overcome anything, is to acknowledge that you can't overcome it. God, I wish I could just stop gossiping so much. I wish I could just stop telling these little lies. You can't. That's hard to admit, isn't it? No, 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 I could cut back. I could... I could temper it. I could temper it. I could be more forgiving. I could be more understanding. No, you can't. You just think you can. Now, why do we want to do that? Why do we want to just go, no, 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 I can do that. I can do that. Because part of us wants to leave God out at all times. 
That's the challenge that we have. There's two parts inside of us. One that can hardly wait for us to totally embrace God. And the other part that realizes if we do that, it has no role to play. It will be, as step three says, the hole in the donut. If I give up everything, holy cow, I'll have no territory left in my kingdom. I'll, I'll give up the drinking territory because it's killing me. But certainly, I stay in charge of finances and romances and politics and all the other decisions and how I can be happy and what I'm going to say and who I'm going to help. I'm still the captain of my soul. Well, if you want to be happy, you better give it up. And um, that's what I think step one involves. It is an acknowledgement or the beginning of an acknowledgement that anything I stay in charge of is going to be a disaster. Now, this flies in the face, and I'm the first to admit it, because what were we taught before we entered the spiritual world? We were taught how to get along. See, in other words, there's the spiritual world, and then there's material world, where you're going to accomplish it by yourself. They don't talk often in Wall Street about use God to help pick the stocks and stuff like that and how to get ahead and when you're in school and so on down. Only you can do it. You remember that pep talk from your father or your mother? Nobody's going to live your life for you. You have to do it. You are the one. You are the one. And uh, they were lying. God was standing right over here and said, I'll be glad to help all the way through. I'll help you study. I'll help you work. I'll help you with the legwork. No, 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 no. Thank you, God. But I'm one of those people that doesn't need God. I don't need help. I'm self-sufficient. And if you got results, people patted you on the back. So your self-sufficiency got reinforced. And if you failed, then you fell down to the bottom because you said, I should have been able to succeed. And I realized that um, all the rules that I was taught were basically true, except for the last one. And that's where the lie still goes on today. And that was that if you attend school every day and you attend every class and you pay attention, you take notes, and every night you study 30 minutes for every class, you do all your homework on time, you do a little extra studying for the test, you will get high grades. And if you get high grades, you will get into a good school. And if you do it again there and study hard, then you can get and get, go into become a doctor. You can become whatever you want because you studied hard, you followed the rules, and you did this. And then you will get a good job, and then you will get paid more money, and the harder you work, you will move up, and eventually blah, 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 and then you'll have a house, two houses, and a boat, and a bump, and a wife, and, a, and the kids, and that. And so far, true. And then you'll be happy. No. No. <clears throat> that was the big lie. That all of this was leading to happiness. And that plan is a real reason why we have so much difficulty living in the present moment. Because we've been taught all our lives that happiness lies just ahead. Just ahead. As soon as you get, then you'll be. As soon as you get, okay, so i got to get out of grammar school. Okay, out of high school. Okay, it still isn't working yet. Okay, out of college. Okay, it's not working yet. Okay, get married. Okay, it's not working yet. Okay, oh, it's just up there. And then you look on the TV screen. You're not happy? No, I'm not. Do you have a Porsche? No, I don't. Well, if you did. So, <laughs> every product that is advertised is telling us not to be happy in the present moment. You haven't got what it takes to be happy this second. And so we're always moving ahead, grabbing, grabbing, and we never take time to inventory and take a close look to find out that we're already happy. And we don't need to go anywhere. And that's what this does. That's what surrender does. Stop that journey. Stop all that nonsense. We're going to slow down. You're going to give up. 
and some amazing things are going to happen to you. That's a lot to cram in to that first step. But it's all in there. It's all the precursor for all these wonderful things that are going to happen. And you can come back, no matter where you are in the program, the answer is you've got to let go more. You have to let go more. You don't learn anything more, you surrender more. And the more surrender, the more gets revealed. And it feels like you learned it, but you didn't. It just was given to you. You didn't study it, it just was revealed. And that's an entirely different process than studying. And so, that's all I got on the first step, is that it is clearly... Um, I guess I could add in, don't drink. Okay. So. <laughs> for, the, for the purists in the audience. <laughs> so anyway, we get defeated and we're down at the bottom and... Um, and it's awful. And um, all of a sudden, somebody's starting to sneak in some spiritual stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Well, what is this power greater than ourselves? That's God, right? Oh, that's the God when I was in the Catholic Church. Oh, I don't want that. <laughs> so we have a lot of ideas about... God. And the chapter of the agnostic is the, one of the most brilliant chapters in our book because it very carefully shows how to handle all those objections that we once felt. As Bill writes on the first page, half of us were atheists or agnostics. Half of us. And probably half of us still are. You know, I don't know about that. I'm not interested in that God thing. I don't know. And the other half is going to church, wonder why it doesn't work. <laughs> why am I still drunk? What's wrong with the power in there? What is going on? So there's, there's a lot of negative feelings towards this idea of God. And um, I had a lot of other negative ideas about AA. I had a lot of things in AA that offended me. I didn't know that that was the secret word I could have used to get you to adjust to me. Oh, no, that offends me. Oh, well, then we won't do it. <laughs> Certainly, number one on the list was the not drinking part of Alcoholics Anonymous. That offended me way up here. And I'm very grateful that you didn't adjust the program to me. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? And I didn't, I thought the uh, idea of the fifth step was the complete invasion of privacy. What about my rights under privacy? I don't want to do a fifth step. Well, if we were sensitive, we'd go, well, then we can find a way around that. Don't worry, we can find a way around that. <laughs> so you can see we would do everyone a disservice if we ever adjusted AA to them. We, we might sign their death warrant. We might sign their death warrant. If we try to accommodate anyone to our program and make room, special room of some sort. And, of course, we see that in the biggest objection that most of us had is with God. Ah, geez, I just don't want to deal with that. And then look how smart our chapter is. We know that almost nobody wants to deal with that. So the, what does it say to do? Oh, let's not worry about it now. Let's just go to some more meeting. Put that on the shelf. Don't relax. Relax. We don't demand you believe anything. Just relax. Keep an open. Can you keep an open mind? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Now I went to mostly speaker meetings when I was new. My sp they didn't want any new people talking. <laughs> Because the, the, the answer comes from listening. 
But I thought that talking was important. The more you talk, the more people could adjust to you. Um, which seemed to be the solution to my problems. If they would adjust, then we'd all be happy. And what happens at speaker meetings is I hear somebody with my story. And I was a member of the American Atheist Society. I wrote papers on all that. But I was drunk all the time. And I came in here and they tricked me into having an open mind. And now God's the most important thing in my life. Or whatever your background was. And then you sit there and you see someone glowing with happiness. So the attraction to a higher power isn't done intellectually. It's not done by going, no, wait a minute. See, your ideas are primitive. These are much more advanced. You were a little bit look. That isn't it at all. We just go, well, let's go look at some of the work that God did. And then you look and you see it. And you see people just going through tragedies and they're still happy and helping other people. And they're doing this. And I don't care what your background is. It's going to start to crack. You're going to start to go, well, just maybe. <laughs> and then this is the biggest confession of all. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> wow. Going right for the juggler vein there, right? <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Maybe these spiritual people have something. And there's a line in the second step where it says, we never gave the spiritual side of life a fair hearing. We never gave it a fair hearing. We never tried it. And so when I'm sponsoring somebody who's an atheist or agnostic, I just, just not worry about it. Let, just come on. And look what you see. And as they see it, and then I finally go, did you ever give? spirituality a trial did you ever give it a shot or did you make your decision based on understanding what would happen if you did give it a shot which is the way i used to reason all the time the reason i don't pray is i know ahead of time it wouldn't work <laughs> and um and then i was worried what if i prayed and it did work i'd look like a jerk <laughs> all my former friends would ridicule me you can see how the ego is in there and does not want us to have anything to do with God. And so we take on the role of this and the role of that. So I maintain adjusting AA to accommodate anybody could be signing their death warrant. Even though it looks like we're being nice. Well, let's carve a little space out for them. Let's have the, we got the regular meeting and then the non-believer section over here. Cut them a little space. Let them, you know, keep their old ideas. We don't want to be offensive. They might all die. They might all die. Because we wouldn't tell them the truth. And the truth is we have a disease that requires a spiritual experience to conquer it. Right there in the chapter of the agnostic. Alcoholism is a disease that requires a spiritual experience to conquer it. Well, I don't believe in spiritual things. Well, you're screwed. That's the end of that. Sorry. I hate to be blunt, but bye. Well, I'm not going to go to AA anymore. Well, where are you going to go? We all know they'll be back. Now, what are we talking about? What else is there to join where everybody's happy? <laughs> I know there's programs where people are miserable, but um, we've got the deal, and the deal involves a higher power. There's, that's the secret of AA. That's the heart of it. There's no, you can't mince words about that. That's it. Am I making a speech that's long enough? <laughs> <laughs> Please send a copy of this to the New York office. Thank you. Okay. I had to get a dig in, didn't I? Anyway, so in the middle of that chapter comes these, these sentences in the chapter of the agnostic are so much fun. God is either is or he isn't. He's everything or he's nothing. 
And then comes the, the, the punchline. What was our choice to be? And you go, you mean you get God by choosing him? You just choose? Okay, I choose Chris. I choose this. Well, how did you become a non-believer? Whatever we were before. Oh, I chose to be. You remember that? I just thought it up. I said, I don't want any of this church stuff. You have to get up Sunday mornings. I'm hungover. <laughs> I don't believe in God. I don't see any evidence. And, of course, if you run around, you can have a lot of fun seeing that there's no God. Look at that. They're having a war, and these people are doing that, and these people are doing that. Look at that person just got run over. You think a good God would allow a person to get run over? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take very long that you've just sold yourself. Yeah, there's no God. <laughs> But then when you go to bed now, you go, well, that means I'm all alone. <laughs> it's just me against the whole world. Me. Wow. Oh, God. I better have a drink. <laughs> so we created a world that we lived in with no God. I mean, you know, the world that you live in is there's a building material to build that world, and it's thought. That's what your world is composed of. And it's all the thoughts that you put in, and then you emotionally react to those thoughts. Let's see. I live in a world where I'm the only one. Everyone else is against me. I have to f compete with everyone else in the world. There is no God. I'm all by myself, and I'm not much, but I have to pretend I am. Well, I guess I'll happily go to sleep. <laughs> <clears throat> so we look for something to help us in that world, and alcohol fixed it. And alcohol was a power greater than ourselves, and it did fix the world. And after the third drink, we looked around and said, no, this is more like it. <laughs> now, this world I like. This world I like. So we already knew that there was possible to move from our scary world to a friendly world with a power greater than ourselves called alcohol. Unfortunately, that power didn't love us. And so when we come in here, we shouldn't be such doubters that it's possible to be transformed because we did it every day. We ran into the bar and said, I can't stand it. I'm sober. It's awful. What have you got? And we had three drinks and looked around. Now, that's more like I remember smiling at the bartender. That's more like it. That's more like it. So you can see this whole chapter, the whole thing of step two is the debate. The debate between our heart and our mind. That's the debate. Don't give in to those guys. They're all crazy. They'll have you praying and doing all this stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and that's why you got to keep reminding people of desperation. It's the only thing that can win against the ego is desperation. And thank God, I, I thank God for people that have slips because they teach me Whoops. I mean, I just learned an awful lot from that. And um, I've always said that if nobody died of alcoholism, we couldn't call it a fatal disease, and it might be harder to get desperate. So even our fallen friends have served us well. And I feel sorry for them, but they're up there happy. And But it was a necessary thing. And otherwise, we'd start coasting. Go, well, isn't that bad? They don't put poison in alcohol anymore. <laughs> and boy, you stick around here and you watch out and back and you go, oh, my God. So you can see desperation reinforces our relationship with God. That's the only connection that we have in the beginning is God is solving desperation. But then... <laughs> And I'm jumping ahead to somebody else's territory. But when we do have this wonderful awakening, now there's two forces that are holding us close to God. One is we don't want to lose this connection. And two, we don't want to go back to the hell that we used to be in. So we have a two-pronged thing that's holding us close to this higher power. And again, it all starts by desperation, and winning this debate in step two. That's why he calls it the chapter of the agnostic. The doubters, all of us. And it's just brilliant the way he handles it. What was our choice to be? And then at the very end, 
deep down inside of us has always been the fundamental idea of God, just like the idea of a friend. And finally, when we drew near, right, Ralph? He disclosed himself to us. When we drew near, how do you draw near? Taking all the steps. That's our map. This is, we're here and we want to get to near. (laughs) And that's the map. Now, the map doesn't take us to Washington, D.C. It takes us inside. That this is an inward journey where we go from our old ideas to God's ideas. And we're put in touch with his vision of the world, and we get rid of ours. And all of it is done by destroying things, by getting rid of, not by getting anything. Because what we want is already there. We were born with it. We were born connected. We want to get reconnected. Some people have this big awakening. They go, I can't believe that I forgot all this. I can't believe that I forgot how wonderful God is when you get reconnected. And, um, okay, so we're chugging along. I wrote down one idea about step three. Oh, yeah. I'm glad. Sometimes I go through these things and I go, why didn't I talk about that one topic? I think the heart of step three is when uh, Bill writes, selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of our problem. Selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of our problem. Uh, And not long after that, our problems are of our own making. All this material is right there in that third step. So if you can see that selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of your problem, and with a tough sponsor, they can really point it out. Don't you see? You were self-serving when you did that. You weren't really being nice to her. You were acting nice so you'd get to use her car. (laughs) See, a selfish person doesn't know anything about kindness. They only know how to act kindly because they watched what kind people did. Oh, is that? Oh, you get something good if you... Do this. Oh. Then if it doesn't work, bam. So it turns out you weren't. You didn't mean any of it. And so I was thinking about self-centeredness. What the heck is it? I think it's perception. I think that's what you see when you look around. You see that you're the center. And I, I, I don't see how anybody could help but grow up self-centered. Because you're a little kid, you go out in the backyard, you look around, there's the neighbor over there, and here's the baseball field, and there's that. And as you turn around and look at everything, you're in the center of everything that you just looked at. Yeah, there's that, that. And what's in the middle of everything I just looked at? Me. So it's only normal to see everything with you as the center. You know what I mean? How could you not? But the process of growing up, we start learning that this perception needs to be changed, that there are, as my parents said, there's other people in the world. Really? (laughs) And as it turns out, they mistakenly think that they're the center of the world. And we're having collisions, instincts in collision. Hey, wait a minute, I'm the center. No, no, I'm the center. Well, I need this and I need that. And so you can see that there's a lot of disharmony created by self-centeredness. And, I, you know, I think Bill even makes reference to this in the 12 and 12, that, you know, way back when, when they thought the Earth was the center of the solar system. Why did they think the Earth was the center? Because they lived there. What the hell else would be the center? <laughs> I live on planet Earth. I'm looking around, and here's all these other things. Well, if this has to be the center. Why would they make the center where I'm not? Does that make sense? <laughs> the ego forces that conclusion. And then the astronomers, I guess Bill said, you know, Galileo, they were going to put him to death. He said, you know, I've been studying. I hate to tell you guys this, but it, the evidence shows that the sun is the what? Bang. 
Because if the sun was the center, I'd have to change all kinds of ideas. We'd even have to change these books I wrote. That, that's too much change. Bang. So here we are, and, but out of desperation, we're willing to agree that possibly self-centeredness is the root of our problem. And then our self-centeredness takes over and says, I'm going to do something about that. <laughs> okay. Let me see you get unself-centered. Well, I'm going to stand over there, and then I won't be in the center here. I'm going to look in the mirror and look at life through here. I'm going to... <laughs> Every sentence starts with, I am going to, I am going to, I am going to. As you see, you cannot get out of self-centeredness. You can't. So how do we get out of it? We go to the true center, which is God. And we make everything God-centered. And we are no longer the center. And, of course, it makes sense. And we go, yeah, boy, that feels good. But part of us doesn't want to do that because we won't be the center of anything. So there's a great battle that goes on in giving up our royal position as the center of our own little world. It's a struggle that we all have to go through. And it goes on through the rest of the steps. That's really a lot of what the rest of the steps are, is this struggle to give up more of our territory to God. It just, it's easy to give up the drinking, but the rest of the stuff is optional. It looks like it. <laughs> and it becomes harder. And so I realized that I created all my problems by thinking about things and then reacting to them. And the reason I thought about them that way is because that's how I saw it. I saw those people talking over there, and it was obvious they were talking about me, and they're plotting something. <laughs> well, could you hear them? No, but I can tell. Look, I can see them. They're one, two, and they, they glanced at me, and then they're glancing back. See that? See that? <laughs> So now I go to my room to think about this. <laughs> wow, what does it mean? And then I make up what it means, and it's generally very scary, and I can't sleep because I'm frightened. I'm very frightened. And it all came about because of my thinking. My thinking was wrong. My perception was wrong. My thinking was wrong. And I created a mess and it's very painful where, where to live in that mess that I created. And so we come in here and we go, well, how do I get out of this? Well, you're going to have to do a lot of work to smash old ideas. That's how we're going to get out of here. Because you have wrong information and you're reacting to wrong information and that makes you get upset. And you remember that great line, I, I forget exactly where that comes. Oh, the fourth step, I guess, the inventory. The idea that we can drink like other people has to be smashed. Well, that's what has to happen with all our other ideas. Smash, smash, smash. Well, maybe I'm the center. No, you're not the center of that either. Smash. But, but don't you think I'm still doing a good job in this little? No. Bam. But <laughs> I think I'm a good father. My, ch my children love me. Blah, 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 blah. God can make you a better father. Smash. There's nothing that we could keep. And boy, that is not fun. Well, don't you think? I no. Whoa. <laughs> don't. Don't. So that's when you go, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to run this crap by my sponsor anymore. This is just. <laughs> He's got a. He has a weird way of looking at things. I mean, good Lord. I want to get a sponsor that will cut me some slack. Slack. That's what I need. Mean. I don't need a, a tight rein. I need some slack so I can. <laughs> Give me some slack, isn't that a, what a, 
battle cry that is. <laughs> oh, I told you we'd have fun with this stuff. The reason this is fun is we are funny people. Human beings are funny. The struggle going on the, up here is hysterical. <laughs> but it only looks hysterical when we see somebody else doing it. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> but as we get some humility, we start telling stories about ourselves. You're not going to believe how I handled this last night. And then we... Tell it, and then I laugh at myself. Look at that. God, how big a jerk am I? And then spiritual pride kicks in. Those of you who have been around a long time, you know, somebody with 40 years of sobriety shouldn't be doing this crap. <laughs> they ought to be happy all the time. That's spiritual arrogance. Somebody with ought to be. We shouldn't be moving in that direction. If we were desperate when we came in, and we desperately needed God, if you've been here 40 years, we should desperately need God 15 times as much. Because we've now gotten rid of all forms of self-sufficiency. And without any practice at it, we'd be lost without God. When you come to rely on God for everything, boy, you really need him. You have nothing to fall back on. But he's always there, so you don't have anything to worry about. The last thing is um, in the 12 and 12, and then I'll, I'm right on time, right? Um, Bill brings up a paradox. We have two paradoxes that have been, I think are come on early in AA. And one of them is that you give up by surrendering. You win by giving up. And that certainly looks like it shouldn't be true. But it is. And we really learn about that in step one. And um, the second one is this issue of independence, my independence. <laughs> I call it uh, freedom. I remember when I was drinking, I felt like I was a slave to alcohol. And then when I stopped drinking, I was free. Free of being a slave to alcohol. And I started going, well, this freedom doesn't last very long, or it doesn't, I'm not as excited about it as I was a week ago. Oh, yeah, but you're free from that. Yeah, yeah, I know I'm free from alcohol, and I'm, <laughs> I'm still all agitated inside. Yeah, but you're free. Yeah, I know I'm free, but I, I'm still <laughs> agitated inside. So what does freedom mean? It means I can do anything. I have 360 degrees I can head. 360 choices I can make at any given moment. Now that's a deal, right? Well, which one's the right one? <laughs> I don't know. I'm constantly making the wrong choice. That's my problem. Bad choices. You ever hear that one? Bad choices. Constantly making bad choices. Well, um, what if we gave our freedom back to God? What if we did that? That's the most precious gift he gave us was free will. Why don't we give it back to him? Say, God, I love what you gave me. I'm willing to sacrifice it and give it back to you. Now, he makes the choices. And, and this is the paradox, we now have freedom. Or independence, as Bill calls it. Because, just because we got free of alcohol, and alcohol wasn't jerking us around, guess what was? Our character defects. We weren't making free decisions. I wasn't freely deciding. I'm sitting at my workplace. I'm a happily married man. Lovely young lady wants to know if I could talk something over a cup of coffee. It wasn't an intellectual decision. She was very attractive. I thought for her good, we ought to go down and maybe talk about some coffee. Do you think that was a free decision? Or do you think lust crept in, disguised itself as a helpful person, 
<laughs> and said, go ahead and have some coffee. You see what I'm saying? I wasn't free. What do you mean I'm free to make all these things? And so the point Bill makes in the 12 and 12 is that by becoming dependent on God, we achieve true independence of spirit. And that's a real paradox. But as you ha experience it, you understand it completely, that it frees you to instead of becoming a master, you become a slave, a slave, a servant. <laughs> I did a thing on slave and servant that they both do the same job, but the servant does it voluntarily and is very happy serving their master. And the slave is just doing the same work but can't stand it because it wasn't his choice. You follow what I'm saying? It was not his choice. And so we come to the end of this that um, the highest pay grade in AA is servant. And to understand that, it can't be understood. It has to be experienced. Every principle that we have in here has to be experienced. And the experience is the teacher. And if you talk to people about their God, they will tell you about the experiences that they had. That this power made the world look better. It made me feel comfortable in my own skin. It made other people look wonderful. And they're all are loving, wonderful people. It transformed everything, myself, the world, the whole thing. And it became clear that God was at the center. And as long as we kept him there, that life would always be fine. No matter what happened, we would be in touch with this God and realize that all is well. That's a pretty good payoff. And we are off to a good start. We got through our first three, but the best is yet to come. Thank you all very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.